Hey, how's it going everybody? Welcome back to Patagonia. So today I'm going to talk about colon polyps. Uh, I'm getting ready to go back on to surgical pathology and on the surgical pathology service at my hospital and at most hospitals, you're going to see a lot of colon polyps. So people obviously get colonoscopies regularly to screen for colon cancer and uh, becoming aware of these entities is very important. So let's just dive right in. And sorry if you can hear my dog barking in the background. All right, so first up we have adenomas. So as opposed to a serrated polyp, you can have a conventional colorectal adenoma, which by definition is low grade dysplasia. So in like a tubular adenoma or an adenoma, you're gonna have picket fence nuclei that are elongated and pencilate, uh, pseudostratified, hyperchromatic. And generally the nuclei retain a basal orientation in the bottom half of the cell. And for me, just at low power, uh, if you throw the slide up and you see a darker section or a very blue region, uh, obviously that's a clue. You wanna go in at high power and assess the nuclei and you could be uh, dealing with a TA or a tubular adenoma. So the low grade dysplastic changes should involve at least the upper half of the crypts and the luminal surface. Uh, there can be rare morphologic findings, which are of no known significance, including uh, panath cell rich, squamous morules, and clear cells. And generally adenomas are subtype based on their architecture. So you can have a tubular adenoma, a villus adenoma, or a tubulovillus adenoma based on the percentage of uh, the architectural component. So if it's mostly tubular, it'll be a tubular adenoma, mostly villus, villus adenoma. And if it's mixed, it could be a TVA or a tubular villus adenoma. So the GI pathologist, at least at my institution that I talk to, he doesn't get too uh, caught up on the specific numbers, like, oh, it's 40% this and 30% that. Uh, just does it based on gestalt of you know, what do you think it is mostly composed of? So if it's predominantly one architecture type versus the other, then you can make the call based on that. And I think that's a simpler way of looking at it instead of trying to obsess over exactly what percentage um, the polyp is made up of, tubular versus villus. So in adenomas, by definition, they are low-grade dysplasia, but you can have high grade dysplasia or carcinoma in situ. And that's, in these cases, you're gonna have significant cytologic pleomorphism. So in general, with dysplastic things and high grade dysplasia, we associate that with pleomorphism. So that's not surprising. You can have rounded, heaped up cells with an increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, open vesicular chromatin with prominent nucleoli, and you're gonna lose that basal orientation, it's gonna to extend to the luminal half of the cell. Um, in high-grade dysplasia, you can also get architectural complexity, uh, such as cribiforming, solid nests, intraluminal necrosis, um, which is what we're seeing here, some intraluminal necrosis, and then absence of definite breach of the basement membrane. But if you do have neoplastic cells, through the basement membrane, then that is going to be known as, oops, sorry about that, intramucosal carcinoma. And that's when neoplastic cells, as I mentioned, breach through the basement membrane and into the lamina propria, but not through the muscularis mucosa. Um, it can be single cell infiltration, small and irregular or angulated tubules, or market expansion of back-to-back -back cribriform glands. So there's no or low metastatic risk in intramucosal carcinoma because remember uh, histology of the colon, the lymphatics and the vessels are in the submucosa. So if it's just in the mucosa, the uh, malignant cells or the dysplastic cells aren't gonna be able to spread um, to spread, they need to be able to get into the lymphatic channels or the blood vessels. So there's no or low 
metastatic risk. I think there are some papers perhaps reporting that it's possible for it to spread metastatically, but uh, low risk in the, at least when it's in the mucosa. So when you get invasion into the submucosa, you can uh, note that is occurring by this desmoplastic response that you're seeing. So if you see desmoplasia, then you're thinking of uh, an invasive process into the submucosa. And as far as molecular for these polyps, um, the chromosomal instability pathway is most common, which is APC to KRAS P53, and also often beta-catenin and SMAD4 are involved. And then for Lynch syndrome, you have microsatellite instability pathway or germline MMR mutations leading to loss of heterozygosity and microsatellite instability. All right, next up, we've got serrated polyps. And as the name would suggest, serrated is like a knife or a saw with a serrated surface. And the first serrated polyp, very common, is a hyperplastic polyp. So in a hyperplastic polyp, you're gonna see superficial serrations, uh, funnel-shaped, and usually small, and the hyperplastic polyps are typically left-sided with proliferation at bases, and non-dysplastic epithelium, and there's no significant malignant potential. Um, it's not necessary to subtype in reports clinically, but it's useful to be aware of the morphologic spectrum for diagnostic and molecular reasons. So you can have a microvesicular hyperplastic polyp with fine apical vacuoles and epithelial cells at the surface um, and stelate frilly and lumina in the cross-section. Or you can also have goblet cell rich hyperplastic polyps, which are subtle, but are taller and wider crypts than normal with slight surface serrations and the cross sections are more round. And goblet cell rich hyperplastic polyps are extremely subtle. Um, I had one of these, I think on a quiz or an unknown slide session and for me, it was, the only time that it stood out was, well, after the staff pointed it out to me, but also when you compare it next to normal colon, you'll kind of see that this goblet cell rich area is a lot lighter and cleared out, and that contrast will help stand out. But again, for hyperplastic polyps, the serration is up top near the surface, right? So it's not going to be dilated or as serrated or booted at the base like we'll see in our next entity, SSLs. So it's a common debate. Um, oh, is this a hyperplastic polyp or is it an SSL? So SSL, or sessile serrated lesion, formerly known as sessile serrated polyp or adenoma, is usually large, more than a centimeter, um, sessile right-sided lesions. Um, and for me, I remember it to be right-sided because that's where our the transition from small to large bowel is like in the cecum and appendix area. So that ileocecal valve. Um, and I think of it as being like a little S turn that the bowel has to make to go from the ileum to the cecum. And S reminds me of SSL for sessile serrated lesion. So they're usually right sided with architectural distortion at the base of the crypts. So SSL, we've got this classic boot at the bottom unlike hyperplastic polyps that are just serrated near the surface. So down at the base, we've got this booting, and that's classic for an SSL. Um, and only one or more unequivocal distorted crypts is required, according to the WHO, uh, to make the diagnosis of SSL. So you really only need to have one of these crypts uh, with such dilation and booting to uh, make the call. Sorry, my dog is barking if you can hear that. <laughs> So like um, any polyp, you can have a sessile serrated lesion with dysplasia. So you have, this can have several patterns, but all show nuclear atypia, hyperchromasia, and often are sharply demarcated. So many cases show MLH1 loss by IHC. So if you're concerned, consider staining it. And it's not recommended to stratify into high and low grade as it's not reproducible due to heterogeneity. Um, so again, 
anytime you look at something that's maybe low grade or a less worrisome thing like certain polyps, you always want to be looking for high grade dysplasia or any invasion or carcinoma. So it's not the first diagnosis that we're looking for, but it's often the second one, right? If we find something that seems easy, we want to make sure to keep looking and make sure we're not missing something that is more malignant or more worrisome for our patients. And here's a table you can just review on your own. And then I'm also not going to belabor the molecular or the uh, diagnostic implications and the follow-up too much in this video. I think it's kind of redundant for me to just read in this algorithm to you um, and also the various uh, management protocols. I think it's better for you just to reference them on your own. But just to know the serrated polyp molecular pathways often do involve uh, the BRAF or KRAS serrated pathways. And then here's just another table. If you prefer learning in table format, I'm more of a picture guy myself, but they are there to reference. So for a traditional serrated adenoma or a TSA, this is another serrated adenomatous polyp. Uh, it is less common, but it has prominent frilly serrations of glands with columnar cells with mucin depleted eosinophilic cytoplasm. Um, and you're going to have central pencillate nuclei with minimal atypia and then complex architecture with ectopic crypt foci, which is what this arrow is pointing to. So these like slit like serrations, those are ectopic crypt foci. So kind of crypts appearing where you wouldn't expect them to be, which at lower power can cause that slit like serration. So TSAs, um, I've heard them described as the pink polyp. So if it looks very pink, uh, could be a TSA, and it's often increased intraepithelial lymphocytes involved with TSAs. They're often pedunculated, villous, and left-sided, and they can contain either a KRAS mutation uh, derived from the goblet cell-rich HPs or BRAF mutation, which is derived from microvesicular HPs or SSLs. And their microsatellite can lead to microsatellite-stable adenocarcinoma. And that eosinophilic cytoplasm is what is going to cause that pink appearance. So the pink polyp, think TSA. Moving on, we've got a Putz-Jaeger polyp. So this is a hamartomatous non-neoplastic polyp. It's usually syndromic, um, associated with Putz-Jaeger syndrome with a germline mutation in the STIC11 or LK LKB1 gene. Uh, they're most frequently found in the small intestine. They can be multilobulated and then they have papillary or frond-like surfaces, and they have arborizing smooth muscle classically. So uh, very commonly tested, good to know, I'd be able to point out. Uh, could, could occur in a pediatric patient, uh, but could also be an adult. So generally, they're cytologically bland epithelium, and you can have mucocutaneous melanotic macules involved, and there's increased risk of many cancers with poots jaeger syndrome, such as stomach, colon, pancreas, and breast, and more. All right, next up we've got juvenile or inflammatory polyp. These are common in children, but may occur at any age, and they're usually smoothly spherical pedunculated polyps with prominent cystically dilated glands with abundant inflamed stroma. And the surface may be eroded, and you can have dysplasia and carcinoma are very rare in sporadic polyps, but they can occur. And greater than or equal to five polyps or extra colorectal location may be indicative of juvenile polyposis syndrome. And you can see these look slightly different than the Puchiegger polyp. Um, you don't really see the arborizing smooth muscle as much, and you do have more prominently cystically dilated glands. So next up, we've got the inflammatory cloacogenic polyp. So second, this is secondary to rectal mucosal prolapse, which you can, you can see or appreciate prolapse like changes. If you look here with the smooth muscle jutting up between the glands, uh, it's often on the anterior rectal wall within 12 centimeters of the anal verge. So one of the GI pathologists 
another one of the GI pathologists at my institution, uh, definitely pointed out the association of the anterior rectal wall location for this inflammatory cloacogenic polyp. Um, so you may see that in a question stem or, you know, more importantly in practice um, on like a colonoscopy report or something that they see this lesion or this polyp on the anterior rectal wall that could cue um, us to remember. Potentially it could be an inflammatory cloacogenic polyp. Um, and you're going to have superficial ulceration or erosion of the mucosa, thickened, disorganized muscularis mucosae with extension into the lamina propria. So you have smooth muscles surrounding the individual crypts, which is makes sense that it would be secondary to prolapse because that's something you would associate with prolapse, right? And then you have regenerating mucosal epithelium it may appear adenomatous and there's going to be distorted crypts, sometimes can be diamond shaped. And then here's the clinical follow-up guidelines that I am going to just allow you to review on your own. Again, some may have changed like colonoscopy starting at age 50. I think current guidelines may be age 45, but just verify that. Um, I'm a pathology resident, I'm not necessarily a clinician giving uh, follow-up advice to patients, but it's important to know what these polyps look like and so we can get the proper diagnosis to the clinicians to direct the patients to uh, get the proper follow-up and avoid any uh, advancing of these polyps into something more worrisome down the road. So that's it. That's all I've got. Just a quick whirlwind tour of polyps. Um, I like GI pathology. Well, I like all of pathology, but I always like getting polyps when they show up and uh, just something good to review, become familiar with. And I hope you enjoyed and I hope you have a good weekend. Uh, if so, like and subscribe and I'll see you later.